Preparing to live stream the meeting. I had technical difficulties. I never did this before, but I was able to troubleshoot it on the fly at the last minute. Okay. All right. It looks like we're live now. All right. Technical difficult. All right. Wonderful. So um, welcome, Roberta. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me and to uh, you know, let me interview you. It's, uh, I don't, have you ever done interviews before, specifically you? I know Ken has done some before. Oh, I mean, lots. Yeah, yeah. probably more than Ken, actually. <laughs> <laughs> really? Wow, that's good. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I have a few questions for you. So first of all, I'm Jeffrey Brace. I'm uh, the showrunner for VCF East. Um, mm -hmm. I had, um, Ken had did a talk at a virtual show in October 2020, um, and I was looking forward to having you come to our show, but I know you guys are really busy with retired life and <laughs> around the world. So it hasn't been retired uh, lately, so it's been yes. working. <laughs> yes, Marcus is, says to blame for that, for getting you guys to. Uh, yeah, out. I think if he's there, you know, standing near you, you have to say, yes, yes, you are, Marcus. <laughs> but, but it's not a bad thing. Yes, because um, um, so are you enjoying this new company? Are you, so you, did you start a completely new company, first of all, or is it completely new? Yeah, it yeah, completely new. I mean, we sold Sierra I, like um, around 1997 and um, which and it, it's currently part of Sierra is a very small portion now of Activision. Uh, but, uh, and we just, we couldn't compete for five years. We had to sign, you know, a non-compete and we couldn't compete for five years. So what were we going to do? And we were, we were like in our early forties. And so we, you see this boat behind me, probably that's yes. a model of a boat that we, we decided that we were just going to take around the world and kind of became world boaters, you know, a little famous in that, in that way as well uh because ken was writing books about our travels and so we had that as sort of a secondary um experience in our life that uh was kind of fun so but we're not doing that now we don't have that boat anymore mm -hmm. and i maybe to a certain extent not having not doing that and the the um appearance of covid changed our lives in a sense that now we started this little company, I guess you'd call it, called Cygnus, Cygnus Entertainment, and um, with Colossal Cave as our first product. How did you come up with the name Cygnus, by the way? <laughs> well, we after we sold this boat, this boat here, that's a Nordhaven 68, that was called Sans Souci which in French means uh, without cares, no worries. Um, and uh, we sold that and we bought a smaller boat, more of a fast boat, nothing that can cross oceans, just a fast boat, uh, a 60, a Grand, a Grand Bank 60, and we needed a name for it. And I just had been uh, reading a book. Uh, I should, now that I said that, you go, well, what was the title of the book? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember, <laughs> but it, it, a lot of it was about the, um, the constellation of Cygnus oh, in the so sky and, uh, and the, the North star, this was like, I, I'm, I'm really into history, especially ancient history and especially really ancient history. <laughs> and, um, and I was reading about, um, it was about being a mariner, you know, when when boating and, and sailing first started in the world, you know, with humanity and and navigation, and they were saying in this book that um, that that was you know ten thousand years ago or so, and that that the uh, constellation of Cygnus uh, was in such a place in the north uh, of the sky, and it's. Um, bright star called Deneb was the North star of that time period. And, um, and that, and that North star, that bright star was what, how the early uh, mariners navigated using that. 
And, uh, and that was that time period. And I just found that fascinating. And I also found it fascinating because uh, Cygnus is also the, uh, the ancient Greek word for, for swan, and the, which is also a water bird. And boats can be called a water bird, kind of. And I just put it all together. I thought that sounded kind of romantic. So our boat is called Cygnus. And the logo that you see um, with our um, with at the beginning of uh, our bringing up Colossal Cave show the swan coming across and then looking up at a at a bright star. That's the little logo we have on the back of our boat, our new boat. Hmm. And so when we were trying to decide a name for our new enterprise, I just said, I don't know, why not Cygnus and use the same logo as we have on our boat. I mean, there wasn't a lot of thought put behind it beyond that, <laughs> but that's just the way sometimes these things go. Yeah, sort of spontaneous inspiration that just works well. I think so. You know, and Cygnus is, uh, is actually, the word Cygnus is actually used quite often in um, with high-tech um, enterprises, uh, you know, from satellite um, uh, satellite companies or even software uh, for some reason, because maybe because it's a star, it's, it's um, I don't know why, but Cygnus is quite popular in the high tech world. So, so yeah, of, yeah. Like, it's like, it's, it's like inspiration, like, you know, Cygnus is a star, it's, it's your direction, it's your vision, you're going towards that. So I think maybe that's why it is, it's kind of like yeah. inspirational in some ways. It is, and it's elegant too, because being a swan, you know, um, it's just beautiful, this, the idea of it and, and the logo and everything, so. So I, I did start reading through the book that Ken had wrote, um, and I had some questions that I thought about when I was um, reading through that. So we told, it told a little about what Ken's childhood was like, but what was your childhood like? Well, uh, we go with Ken first, since you asked that one first. Um, Ken grew up in, in a family that came, uh, they came out from Indiana in the early, no, it was, I guess it was late, the late fifties. Ken was six or seven years old and they moved out from Indiana. His dad was a, was working for Sears as he was um, somebody that he was an appliance maintenance guy. So he fixed Sears appliances, refrigerators, TVs, washing machines, whatever, you know, that went on the blink for, for Sears. And that's what he did. And they moved out uh, for more um, advantages, getting not so much getting a job. He already had a job, but um, just more opportunities, I guess, in California. Moved out to California and um, to Southern California. And uh, his he, Ken had three other siblings, um, three boys and Ken. So there was a family of four boys. And um, and the father, who was an appliance guy for Sears and had a little bit of it, just a, sort of a typical middle class upbringing. Uh, and uh, in, in Pomona, California, if anybody wants to know. <laughs> and uh, I <laughs> I was born in Pasadena, California, so I was already here uh, when when Ken moved moved in to California. I was I was already in California. and. Um, uh, my dad was a, you know, we talk about dads, I guess you could say it, it in that, in those time periods, the moms didn't work as much. And so Ken's mom was not working. She had four boys to take care of. And so that was that. And my dad was working for the County of Los Angeles as an agriculture inspector, which means that he would go to um, the different farms. And at that time, which was in the 50s and the 60s and going into the 70s. And uh, in the 50s and the 60s, Los Angeles County, a lot of people don't realize this now. It's it's just so sprawling, you know, just so big and sprawling uh, with homes and, and everything and buildings. And but back then it was called the breadbasket of the United States, was the Los Angeles County. And now people go, what? Los Angeles? Farms? 
Yes. <laughs> yes, that is true. It, every, uh, every, okay. every place had was like a farm area at some point that, you know, cities were started from nothing. Right. Right. And well, and even the city of Los Angeles was not that big at that point. And uh, but there was it was perfect climate for crops and especially citrus, um, uh, oranges and lemons and and um, uh, strawberries and uh, avocado. And I mean, but, but a lot of a lot of farming was done in Los Angeles County. And so my dad was a, a horticulturist. I had a degree in that and he was uh, he would go to the farms and make sure the farmers were doing everything as they're supposed to be doing according to the county government and not use overusing pesticides or whatever it is bugs you know or if farmers had questions and sometimes in the summer you know he would take me with him which I always thought was great because I would just be me and my dad and we'd just drive up to the various farms and talk to the farmers. And I, I just thought that was really interesting and cool. And every now and then uh, he would bring home a puppy. I, I remember him doing that. <laughs> just every now and then he would bring home a puppy and, and, um, and it was kind of, I remember one time he came home and he, he, from work and we were talking to him in the kitchen. And all of a sudden I noticed this little tiny face looking at me from his pocket of his jacket. And I looked at it and I went, a puppy. <laughs> and it was, a, you know, it was, it was the last puppy he had brought home because um, I was a teenager by then. But um, farmers would say, oh, you know, my, my dog just had a litter. You know, do you want a puppy? And sometimes my dad would say, okay. So that was my dad. And my mom stayed home with me and my brother. And um, so my upbringing was probably, I lived in Claremont, California which was, uh, there are some famous Claremont colleges there. Um, and, um, and I guess my upbringing was maybe a little bit, you know, higher than Ken's maybe, he, but not like a whole lot, but that was sort of my upbringing and his. All right. Well, was good. Uh, not that um... interesting, but <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, some people are just, you know, average, you know, average, yeah. average people, you know, and uh, uh, both Ken and I had good upbringings. We, we didn't have any problems. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it said that uh, the book had said that he had some, had a rough um, childhood with his father and grandfather. And, and I think it was his mother. Yeah. yeah I say too much, but yeah, he had a little rougher than me, but I wouldn't say it was rough. I mean, yeah. he, he was fed. He was he was clothed. He was, yeah. care of, you know, uh, I don't I don't think any childhood is perfect. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes yeah. I think the the perfect childhoods are not always as perfect as it may seem outwardly. Yeah. Yeah. So what about your your now that brings to mind like your. Your genealogy, where did your family originally come from? Then they eventually settled down in California. Well, uh, originally, originally, um, before they came to the, to the U.S., my mom's family came from Ireland and my dad's family came from Germany and Wales. Mm, Wales. Interesting. I know. I know. And Ken... <laughs> What's and what's interesting is well, and Ken's mom is all almost all German, mm. and his dad is essentially all Welsh. So it's kind of like with me, my dad is German and Welsh, and so Ken is German and Welsh. Um, but my mom threw in the whole Irish thing for me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be like him, German and Welsh. <laughs> but then, uh, but 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 my family on both sides. My dad's and my mom's moved. They both moved to Iowa. Yeah, in the late 1800s, and um, and so my mom and dad were both born in Iowa, and they both um, moved to California separately. They didn't know each other at all. They just they moved to California separately. And Do you know what year that was? Yeah, my mom. Well, my mom. It was after World War II for my dad, 
and and after World War II, he 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 was a gunner in um, the B B B twenty nines, the main gunner, and um, in in the Japan arena, and um, and after the war, he went to college and got his degree in horticulture in in uh, Ames, Iowa, and he drove out to California after that. So he would that would have been. 50, maybe. I think he did he did a six-month stop in Brownsville, Texas, um, helping to examine oranges as they went into crates, you know, coming up from yeah. Mexico. <laughs> you know, he did that at, right after college, you know, to kind of get into his whole horticultural farmer thing. And um, and my mom's family moved to California when she was just 12 from Iowa, um, my grandma and grandpa to uh find better work in California and opportunities. So they just met, they met later at a dance in the early, like 1952 or something like that. And they just happened to both have been from Iowa, which is one of the things that they had in common. Small world. (laughs) Yeah. So as a child, did you, you know, what did you want to do as a career? What did you want to be when you grew up, so to speak? Well, Early on, I think I always wanted, I know I always wanted to tell stories in some way, shape or fashion, whether it would be writing or, or, um, you know, uh, with art or with camera, you know, computers were non-existent then. So that never, that never came to be thought of as, oh, I'm going to do storytelling with computers that, that just wasn't there then. Uh, but I always liked to tell stories, had a huge imagination, was very creative, very curious person. I still am extremely curious of a person and like to know everything. You, you know, there isn't hardly anything that somebody could talk to me about that I'm not going to find it interesting. Um, most people I don't think are like that, uh, but, uh, you know, I just anything, you know. You, I would really tell me more. Um, and, uh, and so, and, and I love to read. So to me, just the idea of being creative and telling stories or doing something that it, you know, would just take me into another realm or world or something is, I always wanted to do something like that, but it, it wasn't like it was, um, really well thought out, especially as a little kid, you know, I would write plays and little skits and me and my brother and my cousins would act, you know, would do those little skits in front of our parents and just um, costuming, you know, I dress up in things and dress my brother up in things. And, you know, I was always like that. Uh, And uh, then as I got older, I, I, I became very interested in history and especially ancient history, and especially with the whole question in my mind of where did we all come from? Where did it all originate? Where did it all start? Why are we here? You know, why, what, what is it about us? And why do we do what we do? Why do we think what we think? Why do we believe what we believe? Why do we ritualize the things we ritualize? Um, and, and and I don't know, that's just a weirdness of me that I kind of go that way. And that's another big interest of mine. But but as a teenager, um, you know, I still sort of carried a, a, around with me these same ideas of wanting to do something creative or storytelling like. And uh, and then but with my the history interests that I had. I also got into um, archaeology, and um, and so I read many, many books on it. And I, I very strongly wanted to. I thought I thought about being an archaeologist, going to to a college and get an archaeology degree. But my dad pretty much shot that down because you're not going to earn enough money as an archaeologist. What do you want to do? Go dig in the dirt, <laughs> you know? And I didn't have a good argument for that. And. Yeah. Uh, and besides, my in my mid and late teens, I got pretty rebellious anyway, and just kind of got to the point where I didn't even care what I did. <laughs> so, 
how you know how did I get from that to here? That's you know another story, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I do have some more, but I'm wondering, so in terms of time, how, how, uh, are you okay to keep going? Uh, sure. okay. Um, so I left the afternoon open for you. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> to a certain extent, as long as my voice holds out, I've, I know. You know, I've got allergies right now, allergy season. And, uh, so I've got, I've got my trusty water here. Um, yeah, I know. We'll see how I, long. I visited VCF West and for some reason there's something there that makes me very allergic to chickapods or something like that, that we don't I have don't, in New Jersey. I don't know, but I'm right now I'm in the desert um, of Palm Desert, California, and yeah. it's very dry here. And, um, and we just had a lot of wind and wind just stirs everything up. And so yeah. that's why I'm sort of, I'm Zyrtec-ing right now. <laughs> All right. That sounds good. Hopefully. Oh, I think good. you went away first. Oh, okay. You're still good. Did I, did I lose you? I'm still here. Are you still? Okay. I, I, it might be, yeah, everything changed how I look. Well, maybe there's some filter or something. Yeah, no, I am. I'm, am I talking from what you can see right now? Yes, I can. I can see it. Okay. So maybe it's just on your side, maybe you see some sort of delay, but I don't see any delay. Okay. Oh, I think I might be back. All right. Yeah, there's, there's some kind of delay or something. So I'm just going to ignore it. All right. Um, what convinced you to go on that first date with Ken? <laughs> So you you do it in the book. I was talking about he had there was a double date, and then he called you up on the phone, and you know you had trouble remembering who he was, and he was trying to convince you to go on the date. Oh, hold on. There's Ken <laughs> for some reason. There, that's it. Oh, that's it. Oh, it was oh hi everyone. That's okay. What was the problem? But um, I was watching on your computer and I'm remote desktop or your remote desktop to your uh, computer in addition to my computer. Oh, so you shouldn't have been doing that. Well, <laughs> having fun. <laughs> it was his fault. Yeah, it was all, I mean, all of a sudden it just went black, everything. Oh, and then great. when I came back, I was talking and I was just sitting here watching myself talk. <laughs> And I, it was really confusing me that we're good now. All right. All right. Wonderful. You, okay. I'm sorry. It wasn't my fault. It was his That's fault. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the book, he said that he went on a double date. You were dating. You were on the date with someone else. And then, then he called you up afterwards. And then he, you had trouble remembering who he was. And he had to. It was five months later. Five months. Wow, that's a yeah. It wasn't time. like you know a day or two later. <laughs> I see. My memory so, wouldn't have been that bad, you know, yeah. at that age. So five <laughs> months, and then so then he's trying to convince you, and what what convinced you to go on the the, the date with him at, after he's on the phone with you? You want to know the truth? Yes. <laughs> the truth was my dad. Um, mm-hmm. I had uh, I uh, the the boyfriend that I was going out with at the time who knew Ken and introduced us on that. That one night we went out double dating and then, you know, that was it. We just went to a drive-in movie and my boyfriend and I in the front seat of the car and Ken and the girl in the back seat of the car we saw some movie and then that was it. I broke up with him and then I didn't hear from Ken. I didn't even you know, know him. I didn't really pay that much attention to him. Um, and five months later, I just got a, a phone call out of the blue and it just happened to be with my dad was home. So it was, um, and he was in the paper. I mean, he, he was in his recliner in the same room with the, with the telephone. And in those days, everybody, uh, you know, a family would very often have one phone, maybe two. Uh, and by, we had two. So the, the house phone was in the living room and actually the, the family room, what we call the family room. And my dad had a little office and he had a phone in there, but just landlines, you know, landlines. Yeah. And uh, so I, my, I answered the phone and uh, my dad was sitting in his recliner reading the paper. So he was like this, you know, and, and it was behind his paper and I answered the phone and it was some young, young man on the phone saying, Hey, Roberta, you know, I went, yeah. 
Uh, this is Ken Williams. And I remember saying, who? <laughs> <laughs> Ken Williams. Uh, and um, uh, he says, well, I, I, you know, I met you with uh, Bob Rose, you, you know, that, that friend, you, are you still going out with him? And I said, no, I'm not. Uh, and, I, and I still didn't know why he was calling me. And uh, he just said, well, I was just calling to see if you wanted to go out with me. And, uh, and I, I said, well, I had, I had another boyfriend then. I had another one. And I said, well, I'm a, I already have a boyfriend. <laughs> so I, I can't, I can't go out with you. And so Ken was a pretty good salesman back in the day. And he wouldn't, you know, he said, well, you know, I mean, maybe we could just go out for dinner, you know, just for dinner, one, one, just, just to talk and get to know each other. And I said, I don't know how I know you. Can you, can, I don't re quite remember you. And he said a few things that, that I went, you know, that reminded me. And I said, oh yeah, okay. You're, you're that guy. Okay. Um, and I was still good. No, I mean, I've got a boyfriend. I even have a ring, you know, and he's like, well, you know, and he wasn't giving up. And all of a sudden I heard this, this rustling of paper, you know, behind me. And I turned and I looked and there's my dad. And he was, he had put his paper down and he was going, take it. Yes. 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 I mean, he was literally doing this and he's going, yes. And the reason my dad was doing that is because he knew, see, I didn't know because I was a dumb 18 year old. Uh, he knew that the guy I was dating was not a good guy. Mm, yeah. He was not a good guy. Mm. And actually neither was Bob Rose either. The guy before. I, yeah. I didn't know. I think in those days, I didn't know how to pick out the right guys or something. I had some, you're, you're I had some very rakish characters coming along <laughs> in my life around that time. But, uh, but, uh, but my dad was just like, he was, he didn't have any idea who this guy on the other end of the phone was. He just knew he wanted to get me away from this other guy. He says, he's got to be, he's got a real random chance. That's a, he's probably a better random, than yeah, it, I think in my dad's mind, he couldn't be worse. <laughs> and he might actually be better. Yes. And, and he was so adamant, adamant, like, yes. Yeah. I mean, he was, he wasn't saying it, but he was going, yeah. Oh, yes. And he was literally doing that. And, and so I was like, what? And I went, well, and I, I said, well, oh, okay. You know, let's go out to dinner, you know, one night and let's go out to dinner. He goes, well, how about tonight? And I said, well, I guess I don't have anything I'm doing. And so we went out to dinner to a local Mexican restaurant and the rest is history, as they say. The other what? boyfriend didn't last beyond much yeah. next day or two. So what was your first impression of him when you actually did uh, go out on a date? Um, I thought he was, um, that he was good looking, you, you know, um, he was blonde and blue eyed and, and he had a, even though you see him now, but yeah. at the time he had a very nice physique. Yeah. Very nice. And he was, but that's not so much the thing um, that attracted me to Ken. Um what attracted me to Ken is when we went out to dinner at this Mexican restaurant, it was called the La Paloma, which in Spanish is the dove. Um, we, we talked across the table, you know, I said, well, what, you know, what are you doing? Who are you? You know, and, and what are you doing? He says, well, I'm just starting college. I'm just gonna, it, it cause this was in the, uh, no, this was in November. It was November. So I just started college and I'm a freshman. And uh, so, oh, what are you, uh, what are you studying, you know, or majoring in? And it was Cal Poly in Pomona. And he said, physics. And I go, physics? Really? You know, like, you want to be a physicist? He goes, yeah, I think so, you know. And, and, um, and it, I just sort of brightened up uh, because, uh, like I said, I'm a, I'm a very curious person. And almost any subject um, fascinates me, and especially um, science and um, sort of almost mythical things in science and what could be, you know, and, and everything. And I did space, and and um, and I started questioning him about it. I didn't know anything about physics, but um, but I wanted to know. 
And we really literally talked a lot about college and physics, physics and him being a physicist mm -hmm. during that, um, that first date. And, uh, and, and I asked him what classes he was, he was taking with things like calculus and some other like really hard things. And um, I said, God, this guy is smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy is really smart. Yeah. And uh, none of the other guys I'd been out with were smart. I wouldn't call them smart in any way, shape or form. And so Ken was smart. And I realized, okay, don't be stupid, Roberta. Yeah. And he's also good looking. So there you go. Yeah, you're best of both worlds. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> um, so the, then they were, they, he talked about he would be putting in the punch cards into a machine and it would take hours and hours and hours and you guys were waiting. What did you talk about when you're waiting for the, 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 uh, the punch cards to finish their, their, their programming and then have an error and then start all over again? Well, you know, I mean, when you're, when you're young, you, you, I mean, we were both teenagers and, yeah. you know, 18, um, 19, I'm a year older than Ken. So uh, at some point, you know, we started dating and he was 17 and I was 18 and he was just starting college, but he was born the end of October. So he started kindergarten at four. Yeah. Um, so that's why, he was, you know, but, um, um, you know, you just, when you're young, you just find stuff to talk about and do. But I do remember, you know, we did spend our early years together. We spent a lot of time in computer rooms yeah. And these computers were um, mainframe computers. And I think they were generally and probably always, from my memory, um, IBM 360s. Um, and, uh, but they, you know, I wouldn't say they took up a whole room, but they were pretty big. Yeah. And, um, and so we spent a lot of time in our early, we dated for a year before we got married. And uh, because of him taking these, these computer classes, well, he, he started out with physics. But by the second semester, he switched over to um, computer science um, because he had to take electives. So he said he was taking physics classes his first semester of, of in Cal Poly. But he, as an elective, he chose he he chose computers, computer science, and found that he loved that a whole lot more than he did physics. And so by the second semester, he switched over to computers, and uh, so we we spent a lot of time in computer rooms. And he was he was um, programming on these cards and so and and when he was and then putting them in and and waiting but then but what he would do though he would print out what he had put in a few hours before that mm -hmm. so in a sense it was really boring for me and so then you got to wonder why I hung around but you know <laughs> young love I guess you know yeah. but uh, and it was either that or I'm going to be at home with my parents. <laughs> Yeah. So um, I, but, you know, he would have printed out the prior programming that he had done with the prior set of cards that would come out. And so he would go over that and he would be reading them and looking at them and seeing what he had done wrong or any changes that he needed to do on paper while the other, while the other stack of cards was processing. And so there was, there was that, but while we were there, um, the, I, I got involved with operating these computers, uh, not just there, but uh, a, after we got married, he just basically, as soon as we got married, he quit Cal Poly and just figured he wanted to go straight into programming and he didn't want to wait and get a four-year degree. And, and, and he just thought the computer science classes were too slow to get him where he wanted to go. So he, he joined up for, uh, with a, um, a, it was like a, I wouldn't call it a college. Maybe it's like a technical school. Yes. Yeah. Tra you know, yeah like for, a technical uh, trade school. Yes, yeah, yeah. Trade school kind of, it was called control data Institute. I just recently looked up control data Institute um, to, to see if they still exist, but they don't, uh, they don't exist anymore. Uh, but they did, and and there and the thing that they did was they they would teach kids, young people, anybody really uh, to to program. And I remember it was a twenty five twenty five hundred dollar fee, and it was about a ten month program. And we didn't have 
that kind of money. We didn't have that kind of money, but my, my, my dad gave us the money for him to do that. And uh, so for 10 months, he was, he was going to control data Institute. And so of course, uh, and I was working by this time. And uh, so neither of us really went to college. He, he did a little bit, but um, dropped out and I never did. I just didn't. Um, and but I was, you know, he was still going to computer rooms when he was at control data. And he was asking me to, while he was doing his programming and all that, like he would do before, he would ask me to go, you know, um, remove that hard, di you know, those hard disks and put them over here and go get a new one over there and put it in there, you know, or here's a tape, tape drive, you know, put that on, you know, press this button, do that, do this. And so I did, I did that. So I was essentially computer operating while he was programming and uh, just, which was actually not that hard of a, of a job, actually, once you learn the buttons to press and things to pick up and put in, and it's not that hard. Oh, yeah. Thing is, it allowed me to, to get a couple of jobs as a computer operator later on. Yeah, he he wanted you to get a programming job. What did you think about that? He wanted you to be a programmer at first. Yeah, well, while, well, I did take some classes in COBOL, or maybe it was only one class in COBOL at, at um, Cal Poly as well. And I didn't really like it. Um, I didn't. I, I wasn't bad at it. It just didn't um, appeal to me. I, I am more of in the creative side of things. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm pretty analytical. But I'm not a numbers person at all. I'm, you know, math and, and that kind of thing is just, is not for me. You know, it's eye glazing for me. Um, and so I did get a job as a, as a, as a trainee programmer that lasted about six months. And it was for a, a food company called Lowry's Foods that they, they kind of specialize in spices and, and things like that. And they also had done, uh, uh, computer operating for IBM 360s for the County of Los Angeles. And we also lived for a while in Springfield, Illinois. And so I did that for um, Lincoln Land Junior College. <laughs> so well, I had a little bit of, uh, it, through all of this, I did get some, some experience in computers so before the computers came out. Yes. So you, so I wasn't clear what you had, were living, living in California. How did you end up going to Illinois and then you went back to California? Uh, well, a job, um, you know, Ken got a job that he thought would be good for him with the, um, what was it? I think, I think it was the, the state of Illinois uh, that, and, and the, and the capital of Illinois is Springfield. Hmm. Not Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Most people may think it's Chicago. No, it's yeah. not. It's yeah, just like some people think New York City is the capital of New York. It's, it's <laughs> right, Albany, right. so always the smaller town, you know. Yeah. Um, and and uh, and and so he went to work there for the state of Illinois and did programming for them, and uh, thought that was a good job and he should take it. So we moved back. By this time, we had a two-year-old um, little boy. And um, that's where I got my job as uh, at, for Lincoln Land Junior College while we were there. And but it was so we went back in August and the weather was beautiful. I remember just beautiful. And then the fall came and uh, all the trees turned gold and red and 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 dropped their leaves. And it was a really balmy fall in Illinois. And I remember thinking, oh, this isn't going to be so bad. <laughs> this is really nice. <laughs> then the winter came. Yes. And I am, I'm a, I was born and raised in Southern California. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah, I don't even think I owned a pair of socks. You know, my shoes were basically <laughs> sandals or shoes without socks. And my coats were pretty light and it was so cold and, um, snowy and icy and we went back to uh, visit family for Christmas just a few months after we got there and and both he and I were working 
And I was, I was, it, and it was just happened to be a warm Christmas in California and visiting the family and being home again, home again, you know, then being California. And, and I was just like, I can't go back there. I want to stay here. Okay. And, uh, I, I, I got my way and Ken looked for another job in California and he got a job at the Edison company, which is an electric company in California and um, as a programmer and we moved back. So that was short lived. So you had gotten him a gift of an Apple II. Why, how did you choose an Apple II as opposed to a Commodore PET or TRS-80? Those were this the other options at the time did you have any thoughts about well it? he he wanted I mean that's what he wanted oh, so we talked about it a lot and it was uh I think it was like twelve hundred dollars or something like that and again we didn't I mean Ken had had some pretty good jobs and I and like I said I had worked off and on um but uh by this time I had it we just had our second son so I wasn't working at the at the moment um but we didn't you know we 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 weren't doing bad. Uh, Ken was earning some pretty good salary by this time, but twelve hundred dollars was a lot of money. And I remember saying, "Why do you want one of those?" And yeah. he he said, "Well, you know, I think I think that's going to be the future. I mm-hmm. mean, I I think that uh, the that that these small computers are going to take over the world, and you know, and everybody's going to have one." And I was a little bit more. I was skeptical. Like, well, what would a normal family do with a computer? You know, because I just always thought of them as these big rooms that that I had had so much experience. Uh, yeah. And, you know, and even though I knew they were, you know, like the Apple II was small and the TRS-80, I knew that. It's, Ken did have a TRS-80. Um, and, uh, but he really wanted an Apple II. And so I knew exactly, I knew what they were. Yeah. And I thought, well, for somebody like Ken who likes to program, it makes sense. But you know, for a regular people. So, um, but he really wanted an Apple II. And I just finally, I just said, okay, that'll be um, my Christmas present to you. You can go, go ahead and spend the money and get your Apple II. All right. So Sierra Online produced many classic adventure games, such as King's Quest and Leisure Suit Larry. Uh, what do you think made these games so successful and what was your creative process when people developed them? Well, uh, the first game I did, and, and I should go into um, Colossal Cave right now, if I could. All right, let's go to Colossal Caves. That's so cool. um, yeah. And uh, because that is a game that we just brought back yeah. and, uh, you know, and Cygnus Entertainment, our new enterprise is now, um, I mean, it's for sale wherever games are sold, essentially. It's going to be on many, many platforms. But um, like I said, I was skeptical about what, you know, what Ken wanted to do with the Apple II and what he wanted to do with computers. And, and he was adamant he wanted to start a business of some sort. And he, and he cited to me um, Microsoft and Bill Gates and look what Bill Gates was able to do, you know, and and Bill and, and Microsoft was still very, you know, pretty small at this point themselves. Yeah. And um, and I I said, well, well, what would you do? And I and I was kind of afraid too, I think, at the time that he might try to um quit his job and try some business. And and I didn't know how that was how that was gonna work out. And, um, you know, we had two kids now and I was a little leery about what he might do and how that was going to work out. But at, when he was, um, before I agreed that he could get the Apple II, the other reason why I agreed to it um, was also because that was a lot of money for us. $1,200 was a lot of money. That was like a car. Yeah. And uh, is is that, he was working as a contract programmer on the side, meaning in the evenings for uh, another company, earning a little extra money and doing some programming at night. And he had brought home a, a teletype machine. And I think Marcus is, uh, is, or was, is going to be setting up a. Yes. Sort of a actually, 
Yeah, so at the Vintage Computer Festival East, there's um, two guys, um, Ian Litchfield and uh, Thomas Galinsky. They actually have a video that's going to be showing tomorrow where they're, show, they're testing out the teletype that Marcus is going to use to show off Colossal Caves at our, our, as an exhibit. Yes. Right. Yeah, and how that worked. So, um, yeah, so you'll, you know, people will see that tomorrow. Uh, but it it's it's... It, it doesn't have a monitor or anything. It just has paper in it that just rolls out and it's got, and it, it's, it's kind of like a typewriter that it's a machine and it just types out on rolls of paper and the paper just rolls out and out and out and out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, keyboard. yeah. That's a good explanation for those that don't, have no idea what a teletype is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it, and what it, you, you would do with it is, um, you, you know, everybody had landlines in those days. And, and I'm sure that even younger people would remember, you know, the old telephones, you know, where you, you know, would ring and you'd pick it up and put it here. And you had a little thing here for your ear and another thing here for your mouth and you would talk into <laughs> yes, it. Yes. And it was, and it, um, and it came into your home via a telephone line from out on the street <laughs> and it would come into your house. So the teletype machine had, Another little device, I think it was a, a separate device um, that was, was, but I'm not sure. That, so don't hold me to it. But somehow you were able to take this phone with the two, the earpiece and the mouthpiece, and stick it into this thing. Yeah, acoustic coupler. Yes. Two foam round things, foam round things, and you go like that, and your your two pieces yeah. would go into this foam thing. Yes. yes. And yes. and then that would go into the teletype machine. And um, and then you would dial a number, I guess, on your phone, or I don't know if you did it on the phone or you typed it in <laughs> and then, you know, on the teletype machine. I, I don't really know, but that that was my my thing to do. So, but somehow or another, however it worked, and maybe Marcus can explain it to people tomorrow, um, is that. Uh, via our telephone and the telephone line and the teletype machine, it was really like a modem is what it was. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the little thing that you put the phone in was the modem. Yes. And and that would dial into a big mainframe computer in the company where he was doing his nighttime contract working. Yes. And that was a big computer. That was, you know, again, again a big mainframe computer. Probably an IBM 360, because uh, that seemed to be ubiquitous in, in those days in corporations. Uh, and uh, so Ken was just one day he was he was working on his programming for this company and using, you know, going into that into the server of that computer, and he noticed in some part of that server that there were some games in it, and he got curious. He said, "Oh, what are those games?" and 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 uh, I remember three of them. There was one, it was uh, Star Trek. And, and it's all text. Everybody needs to know. Every, it's all text. And it's just typewritten on paper. It's not on a monitor or anything like that. It's just words on paper. Or it's X's and O's, you know, moving around. But not moving, you know, like on the piece of yes. paper. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's hard to explain. Yeah, but, I, I understand. It, yeah, the Star Trek game was more like a, a strategy. I would, it was probably kind of like a, a war strategy between, you know, invaders of space. And, you know, you have your... Is it the Enterprise? Yeah, so it's 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 likely the Enterprise, which is the Federation yeah. ship, and the Klingons. And yeah, the yeah. Yes. And so there was yes. some strategy so that if you move the Enterprise... And and I don't know what the Enterprise looked like. You know, maybe it was just a bunch of X's that kind of looked like a ship or something. And the other things. And so you would you would somehow maybe on your keyboard make a move, somehow an arrow or you know, I don't know, go over here. And then it would print out your your next move, like you just moved here and now they moved here. Maybe a little bit like playing chess, sort of. Sort of maybe like that. Anyway, that was Star Trek. And then there was a football game on there, and and the the team the football players were X's and O's. One team was O's, one team was X's, and you could you could pretend you were like the coach or something, and football strategy to see if your team would win. And 
that was game. Well, then there was another game called Advent, A-D-V-E-N-T. And he looked at it and he said, well, Advent, what, what is that? Um, and so he, he said, well, let's see what it is. And it, it turned out that it was, it began as, as a story that you're, uh, that you're standing in the forest. You know, I, I should by now know those beginning lines. And if Marcus is, is and, and DJ is listening, they're going, you know what those words are. Yeah, it's okay. But I can't think of it right now. We'll look it up um, later. <laughs> you're standing at the end of the road. Yeah. In front of a small building. Um, where a stream is running out and down a gully, something like that, very close to that, and uh, and that w- and that was the words, and and you would go okay, and it would ask for instructions. Do you want instructions? And if you said yes, you would type in yes. Then it would type out instructions for playing the game, and it would sort of give you an idea where you are. You're in a forest, and here's a, a little building. And you can go to the building, but eventually you're going to wind up in a cave and um, and you're going to type in one or two word commands on your typewriter with your computer or your teletype machine. And it would tell and it would answer you back. It was kind of a preliminary um, it, it, um, experiment by Will Crowther, who was the designer, one of the designers of this game into AI, you know, very, very early on AI. Um, and, um, and so it, it would answer you, which was, which was uh, so unique then is you would type in something like, you know, go North, open door, you know, whatever. And then it's it would, interactive. Yes. It was more. interactive. It would answer it. Go, oh, the door opened. And now you see this and it would describe what was inside the room where you just went in and what was there? And, and and you would go and it said, oh, there's there's a lamp here. There's a um, there's a set of keys here. There's food here. There's a bottle of water here. And you go, oh, so it, it, it was very descriptive of where you were. So you could start picturing it in your in your head and you go, oh, can I get that lamp? So you go get lamp, type it in. So you now have your lamp in your inventory. Oh, inventory, what, it, what is that? And, and so just type in I and V, you can do that. So I and V, and says you are carrying a lamp, some food, some keys, and a bottle of water. And then and then it just it just kind of you know lured you on to keep going. Oh, maybe I leave the house, I go back in the forest. Now, where do I go? And it would lead you down trail um, and then eventually to a locked grate down in a deep depression. And it would it was describing all this. And if you typed into it, asking it questions, it would answer you. And sometimes it would just be really silly and say, don't be ridiculous. That's a stupid (laughs) question. You know, so it had a lot of sense of humor and I became fascinated with it. And I just basically, you know, I. I wanted to play this and I started on the teletype machine, but I didn't like playing it on the teletype machine. And so in a sense, one reason why I let Ken have his computer and, and spent $1,200 is I happened to know at that by, by the, about that time that I could play um, Apple's version of, uh, of adventure uh, that was on their machine. So I could play it with a monitor, but it was still text but it was better than on a teletype machine. So that's uh, what lured me into being a, a, a computer game designer so is the, this game. So the new game that you, you know, you rebooted, um, you chose that game, the Colossal Cave, because that was, the, is that because you, that was the first game that you had seen, first computer game? Yeah. Yeah, because they didn't really exist. You know, and, and unless they were like I, I said, you know, in in text form, and until the TRS eighty, uh, the um, uh, the Apple II, and well, there was that the third computer you mentioned, um, is it what a Commodore or Commodore sixty four or it was a Commodore PET actually at the at the time? Yeah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, and so unless you had one of those, um, there was really no way to play. I, I'm trying to think if Pong. 
the um, Atari. Do you happen to know when it came into being? Uh, I believe it was 1976. Okay, so it was, okay, so it, it existed then. Oh, no, actually, um, Pong was 1972. Pong was 72. Oh, was that early? Okay, yes. okay. So yeah. that was the earliest um, any kind of video game or computer game um, system out there. Um, I remember, you know, Pong and Brickout and uh, I, I maybe it, maybe Space Invaders was on it. I'm not really sure. Space Invaders was, I think, much, much later. But that was later. Okay. Yeah. So it was very simple games and it was basically just pixels moving, you know, or just yeah. pixels, you know, even on the Atari machine. So that was about it. That was it. So this game was a story, yeah. really, even though you had to read it, if it, but if you were a book reader, then it, 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 um, it, it wasn't a turn off at all. And uh, but it was interesting because you felt like you were reading a book, like you were traveling through a book and a story yourself, but you were deciding where you wanted to go. And yeah. the book was answering you back, granted in text, but it was answering you back. So as a as a person that loved to read, it was really, it, it just, it just took me and uh, I loved it. And then you had gone on to create, uh, what was the first game that you had created? Um, Mystery House. Mystery House. When I finished Colossal Cave and the and the advent, what that was that what that meant when Ken saw the word advent, it was short for adventure. So the original game was called um, by Will Crowther uh, was um, Colossal Cave Adventure. That was its original name. And uh, um, so anyway, when I finished playing it, I finished it and I I wanted to play more games like it. There were a few other text adventure games by this time on the Apple on the Apple II by um, Scott Adams. I think it was uh, Adventureland, was it? Uh, Venture, uh, Adventure International was his company. Oh. And and he, difference. yeah, he had made uh, a few uh, text adventure games for computer for Apple for the Apple and maybe the TRS eighty. Um, at that time, I played his, and and they were they were good. They satisfied me a little bit, but Colossal Cave was so much more deep and complex, and just more was happening with it, and it was more strategy. And I, I, I felt that I just was very surprised at myself at how taken I was by this game and to the point that I was obsessed with it. And I would go to bed at night just thinking about it. And I was just, I was literally obsessed. And I just, I thought, I've never seen anything like this. I've never, I have never been pulled into anything like this before in my life. And I remember thinking that I can't be the only one out there that could be pulled into something like this computer game with story in it and exploratory and interactive. I, I just can't be the only one. And I, 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 I wanted to see if I could design a game. And I did. I sat down at the kitchen, kitchen table. I mean, it was really the kitchen table uh, with a you know big piece of big piece of a paper, like a thick paper, and just started doodling on it and thinking about, you know, what could it be? And I came up with the idea of, uh, I th first thought I, I said to myself was, what games do you like me? And of course, at that time, the only games I'd ever played were board games. And I was like the game Clue, because I was trying to think of a game that I liked that could be turned into something story oriented, but was a game. Yeah. And so I thought of the game Clue and and then I thought, okay, Clue is a, a, a lot like, and it, it was a period piece from a set like in the twenties or something like that. It was when you see the characters and the house, you know, the house on, you know, your board game, it looks like an old Victorian house. And, and I thought of Agatha Christie stories 
the Agatha Christie novels. And I thought maybe I could put the idea together of an Agatha Christie like story and clue and the game. And I didn't know how that could come about, but I just had this big, several big pieces of paper and a, and a pencil. And I just started making circles and saying, well, it's a house and, and there's going to be murders in it. If it's going to be like clue, somebody's going to die. Maybe more than one, you know, I don't know. And just started drawing on it and doodling on it and adding just in circles, just, you know, like the entry to the house, the outside of the house, the entry to the house. Over here's the kitchen to the house and here's a parlor over here. And and then I kept making this house and scribble things out, get another piece of paper and start over again and adding characters and, you know, and, and, um, and, and, uh, Ways you can die that was very clue like, you know, with the hammer, you know, yeah. you know maybe or with a gun or you know, or something, and uh, a scarf, you know, around somebody's neck, and yeah, and, you know, just sort of started um, building it up and uh, probably worked on it for about a month, and then I suddenly I, I put in puzzles, I put in objects you could get. Um, I put in secret passages and trap doors, <laughs> all kinds of fun things that it's seen in, you know, some of these old thirties and forties movies that my, my mom used to like to watch on TV, you know, put them in. And I, I just sort of built this up and all of a sudden I looked at it and I said, you know, let's, let's say this, I go, I have a game here. I can see it. You know, I can see the whole thing on paper. It's all there. It was like a map. Hmm. Um, I could just look at it and see the whole game in its entirety. And I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> I actually have a game here. And I had never done that before. And it was very profound. Meanwhile, Ken, who, if we remember wanted to go and start a little company it started a, pro a software company of some sort he wanted to compete with bill gates hmm. ken was a really good programmer um i mean he's just a natural and and he was doing a similar language i mean he was he was doing machine language programming and 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 uh creating new languages computer languages and that, and he also had experience in uh, some of the early ai um, uh, programming. So Ken was very uniquely suited to be able to do some really interesting things programming wise with, um, with our Apple II, you know, and, and to figure out what to do. He was programming with a buddy who was working at his job, his day job, uh, that was um, Fortran language for the Apple. He was just like, I think, I think it was Bill Gates, wasn't it? Who, or maybe it wasn't him, but somehow maybe he bought it uh, that put basic on the Apple II, wasn't it? Am I right? Um, no. So I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert. I know, but I know a lot. So the um, Apple, they, they made their own basic mm -hmm. as, as far as I remember the, you know, Steve Wozniak okay. made an integer basic and I think Apple continued to make their own basic. Oh, maybe I, it was IBM. Maybe I'm, oh, okay. Yes, maybe the IBM, IBM PC. Yeah, it was IBM. That's yes. what he did. So, it yeah, so, it so Bill IBM. Gates, yeah. So Bill Gates, he yeah, he, he got, you know, I, IBM saw that he was making the basic programming language for a number of years and he said, you know, let's do yeah. MS-DOS. Yes. That's what it, that's what it was. Okay. I was confusing things. That's um, okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so Ken saw that. And, and so he wanted to do something very similar, but on the Apple II, And so he was thinking, well, you know, um, that Fortran is not on the Apple II, And, and to Ken, that was an important language and it should be. So he was busy with his friend, um, on, you know, on weekends and after hours in, you know, trying to, I don't know how you would do that. I don't know what he did. I just know he and his friend were working on putting Fortran on the Apple II. And that was going to be, that was going to start his, his new software business. 
and I had just finished this game. So, you know, I had this and I go, you know, I have, I have, I have a whole game here. It's just right here. It's just the whole thing. I can see it. It's ready to go. I need a programmer. And at the time, I just was thinking in terms of text only because that's all there was if you wanted a game like this. Just like uh, Adventure International, his his games were all text. Yeah. And so that's the way I was thinking. And so I remember talking to Ken. I said, come here. Look at my game. Look at this. You see this? There's a game here. I, but I, I, you know, can you program this for me? Will you program this for me? And I'm not, I, I know a little COBOL, but I mean, nothing to program something like this. And, uh, and he was no, oh no, I'm, I'm working on Fortran. That's a much more important project. Yes. For, for geeks, I can see why, you know, their programmers are like, oh, this is very important, but he's not yeah. thinking about the general public. You know, Fortran, yeah, that'll be good for programmers, and they like might love that. But for the general public, again, yeah, not, no, 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 he was well. I mean, let's let's not let's not say that me and I did divert him eventually, but me diverting Ken to forgetting his Fortran and going more that direction with more businessy, you know, kind of software um, or languages or you know AI or whatever else the heck he would do. Um, into games, who knows, you know, if I hadn't bothered him, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe I'd be owning an, you know, a Caribbean Island by now or something, you know, like Bill Gates or whatever. Uh, actually I'm glad we didn't, but, um, I wouldn't want to be like that, but, uh, um, who knows? You, you just never know. But I, 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 he just kept saying, no, no, no. What he was doing was, that that was going to be big. That was going to be, and he didn't have time to do this. And uh, so there's an old story that which I've told many times that I took him out to dinner and he came home from work one day and I had a babysitter lined up uh, for uh, for that night. It was a Friday night, and I said I made reservations at our favorite steakhouse. This was in Simi Valley, California, and. Uh, and I got a babysitter and let's go out to eat and just have a good time. And he goes, wow, because he, he loves to go to restaurants. I go, okay. And uh, so we went out and we just had steak and we had all our favorite things. We had dessert, we had souffle and margaritas and what, whatever else. And uh, so things were good. Things were going good at dinner. And then finally I said, I'd like to talk to you about something and I go, my game, because we were all happy, you know, everything was good. And he looked at me and I, his expression went from happy to, and he gave me one of these looks like, I know what you're doing now. <laughs> <laughs> He's butter, you're buttering him up, getting him ready for, for the. <laughs> yeah, like, like, okay, oh, this is what that's all about. Like, you know. And I knew when I brought up the, the thing about the game, he was going to do that. I was prepared because I was, I mean, it's all, I'm being honest. I was. And, um, uh, and I, he, and then he did this, he says, he goes, puts up his hand and he goes, you have five minutes. Now I should have slapped him across the I face. I know because it sounds like you're, you're an interview or something like that. Like yeah, this person. I, I think I was. I was. This. I, it was. Uh, yeah. I. I was. It was like an interview, and uh, and it was like the interview of my life. I thought this was it. This was it. This is a big deal. And I was like, hey, oh, okay. I'm gonna make every m minute of this five minutes. But I had everything ready. I had my patter ready. You know, my sales pitch, and I went right into it and explained everything that I had on this. I said, there is a game here. It's an entire game. It's completely thought out in every way. I know every move, I know every room, I know every puzzle, I know every inventory object, I know everything, everything. It's all there. I know exactly what it is. It would be so easy to program. And as I was going and talking about it, and, and I was very excited and very passionate, he didn't stop me. And, and I, I was realizing as I went on talking that, well, we're past five minutes. 
we're probably up to 10 minutes at least, maybe 15. And all of a sudden he said, well, you know, we could add graphics to this. Yeah, and so went, that's like, yeah. wow. Because like you're, you're <laughs> thinking, you know, in terms of the, what you already knew, which was, you know, a teletype with just text, you're like, oh, wow, that's yeah. even better. And there were no, there were no, at this point in time, there were no um, computer games with graphics at all. Mm. At yeah. all. Yeah. Just pixels moving, you know? Yeah. Uh, but no, no, no games with graphics. And, and so, and when he said that, that I mean, that was like, <laughs> you know, oh, it was breathtaking. Yeah, and um, he's he he. I think at first he thought he could do that my game and Fortran at the same time, and yeah. um, but that wasn't to be. Especially when when he said, "Well, yeah, we could put graphics to this," and I said, "Oh my god, oh that would be so great." Do you know how to do that? And he said, "No, but we'll figure it out." And uh, we did. Now the graphics on Mystery House are really bad. Hmm. And, um, and I mean, they are so primitive, uh, very, very primitive. But the reason they're very primitive is not not necessarily because I'm a bad artist, which I am, but I'm not that bad. I mean, they look like, you know, a second grader and probably a second grader could do better graphics than that on a piece of paper. But but because of the way we had that Ken figured out that we had to do the graphics um, and uh, it was done on a, on a graphics tablet and what a graphics tablet is and, you know, you being vintage and everything. Um, I don't, I mean, they don't exist anymore, but uh, we went, there was only like four computer stores in all of Los Angeles County. And we knew all four of the, you know, where they were. And he went to one of them and said, is there a way to get graphics or to draw graphics into a computer. And one place he went says, well, there's this new thing. And he, and he kind of brought it out and it was like a, a square, you know, a, a, a flat square piece of acrylic, you know, just flat and thin and, you know, about and square. And it had some, some kind of wiring attached to it. And it uh, and it also had kind of this art articulated arm kind of thing on it, and and kind of like a record player at the end of this articulated arm, rather than a needle, it was like a magnetic eye of some sort. I mean, I'm not real technical, so um, so you so what you could do is you could you could draw what you need to draw on a piece of paper, you know, if it's at a house you know, or you know, a house or whatever, a tree, a person, whatever you needed to draw on a piece of paper, but it had to be really simplistic, really simplistic. And then you could take your piece of paper and end the piece of paper like about this, about the size, a normal piece of paper, and you, with your, your drawing on it, and you would lay it down on your acrylic thing and tape it with scotch tape you just tape it there to hold it in place and it had your little drawing on it and then you could take the articulated arm and just with the with its little magnetic eye and you could just follow along one line you know and then over like that for the house and then down and you know and it wasn't very accurate and it was really hard to do that and keep move that little arm and keep it in line and you know, and everything. And, um, but the, but the, but the thing is, and, and we Ken goes, okay, I think we can, I think we can use that. We can, we can figure something out with that. And you, you draw it, you know, and you, you'll meaning me and you could put it, put all these, you, you figure out what pictures you want and you draw it and put it into the game. But there was, but the guy said, but there's no software for it. And we've got the thing, <laughs> but there's no way that it's going to talk to your computer without without software yeah but ken was able to figure out how to do software for it and he did and he wrote software for it and hooked it up to um 
the Apple II and grab, you know, the graphics tablet. And I started drawing on pieces of paper. You know, every every picture you see in Mystery House was drawn by me on picture, you know, on 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 with a you know pencil and paper and um, taped to that thing. And and move, I moved that arm around and uh, and it was very very simplistic and. Sometimes I'd go off the line and it was really hard to do and, and especially to do things complex like a person standing there. It was just no way, you know, to try to do that. So that's really why the graphics look so bad. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it was very early in. Computer it worked. I, I mean, but we it, yeah. we did the game. We sh we took it down to that same computer store. Went, I mean, it took about three or four months for us to do it and put it together. And we took it down to that same computer store, and and um, we said we have something to show you. We were wondering what the what people would think of it because only only we had seen it. And we took it down, and we it was on a floppy disk, and we, well, it might have even been on a um. Tape a cartridge, tape cartridge. Hmm. All right, because that tape. Right? I think floppy disk. Because no, it was on a floppy disk. Okay. Yeah, it was on a floppy disk. Anyway, um, we took it in and and we said, well, you know, we have this this game. You know, would you like to see it? And the computer owner said, well, sure, yeah, go ahead, put it in there. And so we did. And up came, you know, my house that I had drawn, and you know, and we and and I had drawn had text along the bottom about what you see and what's going on and and we we started showing him the game and there were other people in the store and before we knew it then everybody in the store was surrounding the our you know this uh, this computer in the store and looking at our my silly graphics on the monitor and going did you do that that's graphics oh my god you know and they and they wanted to sit down and play it and and they were it was just it was and we and Ken and I looked at each other and went, oh, <laughs> maybe we have something here. Yeah. And um, that started Sierra. Do you think that you you know so you remade Colossal Cave Adventure now as a three D adventure? Do you think that you would remake Mystery House uh, as a new game rebooted? We can't. Um, well, we don't own the rights. It's really oh, sad to say. I, I wish we, you know, hadn't done it, but it was part of the deal. We don't own any rights to any of the Sierra games, um, King's Quest or Laura Bow or. Well, it's too bad. Or so Colossal Cave, I guess, was one that was not um, yeah. copyrated or. or no. Okay. no, it wasn't copyrighted. No. Mm -mm. It, and in fact, it's um, Apple. I mean, it was originally, I mean, there's a whole history. And I did, a, if you if you um, buy our game, the Colossal Cave game, we did something kind of interesting Um when you when you first go into the little building, you know that's where you start the game, and there's this little building, and you go into it, um, and that's where you get your lamp and your bottle of water and your set of keys and your food, just like in the original adventure. We put in a a, a television set, and it was like an old, you know, like a one of the big box TV sets from yes. back like the seventies. Yes. Um, um, because we are the game has a feel like the seventies. And even the interface, although there weren't any computer games, certainly not even with point and click or with a mouse in the 70s, everything was just text, like I said. Um, and Mystery House didn't come out till 1980 as the first computer game in history with graphics. So in the 70s, there weren't even any, you know, any graphics of any sort, but um Anyway, but we just, but the game, the Colossal Cave was, was developed in the seventies by Will Crowther and then later Don Woods. Yeah. And so we, we just decided we wanted Colossal Cave to kind of continue to have that seventies feel, even though it is very modern and very immersive and it's, it's VR, you know, and it's got all the bells and whistles and, you know, for the most part that uh, all the modern games have nowadays very visual, um, lots of sound effects and animated characters and, you know, and everything. 
but it's the same game. But um, um, where was I going? <laughs> where was I going? With well, you were you're just saying how oh, the TV set. Yeah, the TV set. So um, we decided that some people when we first um, when we first started uh, when we launched the game and people started playing it that some people were having a few problems with figuring it out. Uh, it's so different from most of today's games. It is, you know, it is an older game and it and it is in the style of an older adventure game and it is an adventure game. It's the original adventure game. And uh, but it is kind of complex. It's a pretty deep game. And uh, and and it's it's got a lot going on and and it's got timers in it and it's, there's a lot of strategy that goes with it. So I did a a video with tips and strategies of, for playing Colossal Cave, and but I also did a little mini documentary about Colossal Cave and its development and the people that developed it and and you know where it came from, the history of Colossal Cave that goes back to the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky. And and how that all came about. And it's a really interesting story. So we did a little mini documentary on that, the whole history of it. And I was a narrator, you know, on camera. And uh, but with Im imagery of you know, the whole beginnings of it. It's it's really interesting. And Will Crowther himself is interesting, not just the fact that um, that he was a spelunker, which is a cave cave explorers that explored the mammoth caves and then took the, the maps that they had to be, to uh, create Colossal Cave. But he also was one of the main programmers on the ARPANET, which um, was uh, the precursor to the internet. And in fact, he was the main programmer doing the uh, packet switching programming for the ARPANET, and which is exactly what the internet is it's a packet switching essentially piece of software and what that means is uh, that um, that data in little little they call them packages just little bits of data at a time will go from computer to computer to computer rather than one long stream and um, that's what he did so he not he not only developed the colossal cave but he's very instrumental in inventing the internet. So yeah. we, I explain that, but we put that on that little TV. So when you go into the game and we first put it on our VR version. So you go in, you know, our VR version, you know, the quest two uh, and, uh, and in a little building and you get your stuff, but then you see a TV. And so if you click on it, it kind of comes up in an old fashioned way, kind of, you know, little, little snow, you know, the TV set. And then I pop onto the screen and, and start telling the story of the development of Colossal Cave and the history behind it. And then uh, if, and then that ends, if you click again, you get the tips and strategies, how to help, how to play this game. And that we, we thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. And it's they, they, really they, kind they, of fun. They call that Easter egg, you know, some some hidden it's definitely feature. an Easter egg. Yes. <laughs> it, it's a it's definitely an Easter egg. So I think at this point, um, let's see if I can take questions from uh, the YouTube. Uh, let's see if anybody has any questions to ask you, because um, uh, you know we wanted to keep it brief enough for people's attention. Um, okay. let's see. So let me, I put it out there. So well, let's wait a little bit and then we'll come back to it. Um, uh, so did you, you have plans on in making other games with Cygnus? Well, we don't know at this point. Um, actually, I think, um, we're, we could be in the process of looking for, some interesting games that right. might be out there. Sorry, um, I have a first question. What's your favorite computer? Um, this is your favorite computer, not the game. So what's your favorite computer, either past or present? 
Well, you know, I guess you would say that my favorite computer would be the one that I've worked on for the past how many, you know, 30, dec 30 decades, not 30, de three decades, 30 decades, um, 30 years at PC. You know, right, my computer's a Dell laptop. <laughs> so what, whatever one that you use to get the job done, basically, and yeah. <laughs> that you're most familiar with and comfortable with. And I can understand that. All yeah. right. Well, uh, there's somebody in chat that keeps asking whether or not you're going to add any Easter eggs to the colossal cave. Well, I did talk about that, that, that little TV thing, you know, that we well, did. That's not really an Easter oh, egg. Oh, that's not an Easter egg. Oh, it, oh, well, that's kind of an Easter egg. An Easter egg. Um, I'm kind of not part of that team anymore because I'm, I've moved on. I finished my part. So, um, Maybe if we have a, a vote on like how important putting the Easter eggs in, I might be talked into working with the team on, on doing some of that. All right. Um, somebody says, I don't know if this is relevant, but is it any thoughts on the new Dungeons and Dragons movie? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, are we going to go watch it even? <laughs> Or watch uh, it. I, I guess watch it, but maybe be influenced by it. Maybe that's maybe creatively. You know the. You know I never played Dungeons and Dragons. Um, probably my kids did, but I'm not sure. Um, but um, back in the day, and I know not now. Uh, but but Will Crowther. I mean, uh, interestingly, uh, when when he was developing Colossal Cave back in '76. He was a big uh, Dungeons and Dragons guy. So uh, obviously, uh, I think he definitely put elements of playing Dungeons and Dragons into Colossal Cave. I, by the way, I did get send Marcus um, his you know, his phone number. So because I did call him. Um, I, Will Crowther? Yes. Oh, you did? I called him. So because I wanted him to come to VCF East last year no not last year the year before because the the theme of the show was text adventures and we even had on the t-shirts you know many twisty ways and you know from colossal cave and i called him up and i said do you want to come to the show and he said basically he said uh you know you know i had my time now it's your time mm -hmm. you know it was not an interested you know it was something that he did years ago and he was not i would love to talk to him i would so i, would, I, can, I, I can, you know, get to, talk to Marcus. I have his phone number. That was, I, mm -hmm. I I found his phone number um, and called him on the phone because he wasn't answering through emails or Facebook. Oh, or and he just, he just answered the phone, huh? Yeah, so it was old so style. This is like a, a cold call for you. Yeah, it was a cold call. I cold called. <laughs> he was friendly. But he and just, it was like, oh my God, he answered the phone, huh? Yes, I was surprised, you know. I would not expect that to happen. So I talked yeah. to him for like five, 10 minutes and that was it. Five or 10 minutes. I don't know. I don't know how he would feel, you know, when I was doing the, like the mini documentary, the historical mini documentary we did, it was, most of it was about him and his wife, Patricia. Um, and she's was, it's a really interesting story. Even if I, I think we're, and we may have already um, or are going to put it out there on, on YouTube um, but it's an interesting story about them as a couple and what they did and as far as cave exploring and 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 how what what they did. And I don't want I don't want to say too much about all that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like you have to watch, you know, either buy the game, you know, and, yes, <laughs> and go into the little building and watch it. Or, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure if if it's not on, it will be on YouTube. And watch it or just look them up because uh it's you know really his wife patricia was a was a big part of uh the development of this game um i have another question i don't know what it maybe you understand it uh it says about question about space venture where does that stand um it's uh it's being looked at right now um but um we don't know yet what what we're going to do with it Okay. It hasn't been a decision made. Uh, we're evaluating. That's that's a good word. Evaluating. Evaluating. Okay. Um, 
He says, any memories of working with Jim Henson? You know, I never worked directly with Jim Henson. I met him. He wanted me to um, to do a, a game. I, what I do is adventure games. That's what I that's what I do is adventure games. I don't do any other kind of games. And he wanted me to do an adventure game based on his to, soon to come out movie called The Dark Crystal. Oh yes, and and. Uh, and you know that that was really uh interesting to be able to work with with Jim Henson and uh so Ken and I traveled to New York to to talk with him about it we met him we went out to dinner with him but then he basically um said you will you will Roberta you will be working with Christopher Surf who is a good friend of his who um I don't know that I don't think Christopher Surf worked exactly for Jim Henson, but maybe he was I, I you know, looking back, I don't really remember exactly the relationship between Christopher Surf and Jim Henson. But he was the guy that I was going to be working with who would help me with maintaining the story of the Dark Crystal and doing kind of what they wanted or whatever. And um so um so that's it. That was really my only real um, time to be with Jim Henson, not really working with him. He trusted Christopher Surf, I suppose, to keep me in line, <laughs> which he kind of did and kind of didn't. All right. Um, <laughs> I have another question here. How does it feel? Actually, wait, would you consider using chat GPT with a text adventure to write a text adventure game? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. Um, no, how I, like, I, I like coming up with my own ideas. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, how does it feel to have such a significant impact on the video game industry? And what advice would you give to aspiring game designers? Well, it's so interesting to be back after 25 years of being out of the business. And Colossal Cave... It, what brought us back into the business. Back when we sold our company, we were a pretty important company and we had very little problems selling our product. There wasn't as much product and there weren't as, it wasn't as much competition. And we had good, very, we had excellent distribution. We had professional marketing and we had a sales team. And I mean, we were a whole, we were a big business. And so we didn't have to, I mean, we competed, of course. Um, but we, I, I had all of the talent I needed, you know, to, to come up and make quality games and uh, which was very nice. And they were all there with me, you know, um, people were not just working at home in those days. They were, we were all in the same place. Um, and, but now I, I, come back into the business and it's so different and it's so competitive and we don't have the resources. We don't have a big company around us like we did before. Literally, it's just Ken and I doing this, you know, doing Colossal Cave. It's like, it's almost like when we did Mystery House, it was just Ken and I. And, but then there was really no competition. You could do almost anything. I mean, even just adding graphics to a game back then in early 1980, as bad as they were, it was something big and it just sold. You didn't even have to be that good, to be honest with you, which was kind of nice for me because I could learn as I went along. I, I could, like when I, when I sat down to map out my game for Mystery House, I had no idea how to do it. I didn't have any idea. I just, just experimented and, uh, and it worked. But I didn't have to, I didn't have to, you know, the, the competition was very limited. So it was, and, and so as time went on, it gave me time to learn, to figure out what I was doing with, again, without a lot of competition. And it got more competitive as time went on. Bottom line is, to get back to your question, these days, it is so, so competitive. 
And I had really no idea. Uh, just the other day, I was going through Steam. I was looking for um, adventure games. I, I wanted to see today's adventure games. You know, I you know thinking you know what you know what if I did sit down or to write a, a game for my myself, my own game. You know, Colossal Cave is not my game. Uh, I reimagined it as as we 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 say, I guess. Um, but it's not my game. And so I was thinking, well, you know, um, what are adventure games like out there now? And what are, what's the UI for them? How, how are they played? What do they look like? And one of the things that I discovered, and I went to Steam and I was just, you know, I typed in adventure games, you know, putting in, and it was just going on and down, down, down and down and more and more and more and more. And one of the things I discovered doing that is a lot of the games that are called adventure games are really RPGs, which is not, or they're action, action adventure, you know, where it's, it's the, um, you know, it's kind of the war games or you're, you know, you're running and jumping over things and grabbing things and swinging across and guys are coming after you and attacking and you're either fighting them or you're shooting weapons or, you know. But it's all under the adventure category from what it appeared to me to be. I could be wrong. And people that know Steam very well will probably say, Roberta, you're nuts. You don't know what you're talking about. And I probably don't. But it's what it seemed like to me. But there were some. And I, you know, I clicked on them and looked at them. And I thought some of them looked really um, low res and, uh, you know, back in the, you know, maybe not the 80s, but maybe the 90s, or 2000s. And, and I was kind of like, hmm, you know, and, you know, text, text boxes and um, animation, a bit clunky. And um, some of the, some of the games even had the old boops and beeps kind of like sound effects. And, um, and, but these were sort of the games that I remember from, from back then, but by the time I had um, been gone out of the business in 97, my games were way past those. And it confused me. And I did see some games though that I thought I, I should, you know, look at a little bit more at like Stray, that's about with the cat and um, Moss, even though it's about little animals. Uh, still, the graphics were really nice, and I wanted to see the camera movement and um, the UI, especially very interested in that. So I'm beginning research, I guess you could say. But for design, oh, people that want to be designers, you kind of have to do that. I mean, if I'm doing that, and I'm looking at things and and trying to see and understand what's out there. And if you have a, a type of game you really like, you need to do your research. You really, really, and you have to have some talent, uh, either in design, you know, you really, you, you, you know you have talent in design, you, you know it, and, uh, or art, or programming. Um, you, you have to have some, some of that. And, and it's going to take time and, and perseverance, and you're just going to have to keep working at it. And, and you're not, you're probably not going to ex have success with the first thing that you come out with. And you just keep at it and you keep at it. And you're probably going to have to have a job on the side while you're doing it um, to pay the rent unless you're lucky enough that you can get into a, you know, a, a game development company or a big company that's, that is developing games and learn from the bottom up and, you know, work your way in, um, get a, you know, get a, get a degree in computer science, computer gaming, computer design, learn how to do 3d graphics or what, you know, I mean, you have to do more now than, than I had to do. I was lucky. I was, I was, in the right place at the right time when there was literally no competition and 
just just a a young woman with a lot of um, imagination and perseverance and just obsessive and just sat down and did it. And I was lucky. And Mayor and Mayor happened to be married to a very good programmer. Um, it's not an easy business, and and there is so much competition. It's scary, actually. All right. So if you're up for it, I do have more questions, and then you know we'll we'll check in to see how you're feeling. Um, how are you feeling? Well, so I could probably go another fifteen minutes or so. All right, that sounds perfect. Another 14 minutes okay. or so. Um, okay. So uh, someone said, I'm a big fan of your games. How did you come up with your puzzles? I don't know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like, it, maybe it's like, you know, maybe the simple answer is it's a creative process and, <laughs> and you come up with things through inspiration and, and through other things. So yeah, it's, it's um, it, it really is built up. Um, I first, I, the first thing I do is I think of what, what is the story? What is the theme? First of all, you have to think that, is it going to be, if it's, if it's like a King's quest game, you know, it's going to be, you know, medieval fairy tale, myths and legends, you know, it's going to be castles and Kings and, you know, it's probably gonna be like that. So that's the first thing you have to know. What is the theme? Uh, what you're, what is the, you know, you want to, you want to do. Then uh, once you, you kind of have that idea, then you have to think about who you want to be. Now, in the case of Colossal Cave, it's first person, meaning there is no third person character. It's really literally you out of your own eyes as you're going through the cave. But that's because that's the way the original Colossal Cave was. And that's the way I kept it. But I'm pretty known for a, a third person character. You know, you think about... Um, King Graham, you know, or Laura Blow, or you know, or Leisure Suit Larry for um, Sierra. You know, we we had uh, Roger Wilco for the Space Quest. So we're very known for the third person character. So I would think in terms of okay, who you know, who am I? What what third person character am I going to be? What am I going to be doing? What's there's got to be an ultimate goal. Uh, so you, you, you're, you're in this world, you figured out the world, you maybe have figured out the character, uh, and, and then there's gotta be a problem, of course, because you're going to be the hero or heroine and, and you have to fix the problem and that, that could translate into the, your goal, but there, you, there is that. So you have to think, okay. Uh, so let's say it was uh Daventry. So, okay. What's the problem with the Daventry, what's going on here? You know, what, what, what's, what's happening and how are, who are you and how are you going to fix it and how are you going to get there? So you kind of piecemeal it together a little bit that way. And uh, at this point, you're not thinking puzzles at all. You're just thinking about the, the, the big broad, you know, um, thing about it, you know, generalized what it is. Once you kind of got that figured out, now you can think about other characters. Um, and what I would do is uh, I would, at this point, I would do a lot of research. And now in those days, you know, now, now it's easy. It was so much easier to do research. So, you know, it's at your fingertips with the internet. But in those days, uh, I got lots of books. We go to the library, <laughs> literally the library or bookstores, bookstores. I'd buy a lot of books. And I would just um, do a lot of research in into the theme that I was interested in to, to make the game, and I I would make lists. So I would I would make lists of characters. What characters do I want to put in the game? And then I would have good characters, bad characters, and then good characters. And I would say, well, it would be kind of fun to have a witch, and you know, but she'd be in the bad character you know, category. And then, you know, maybe a thief, you know, that'd be a bad character, but then maybe a, a fairy, you know, that could be a good character. And, and I would do a long list of characters and I wouldn't use them all. I just wanted to have a long list to choose from. And then I would choose, I would do a long list of interesting regions that you could travel through as you were, you were, going along on your adventure and say you start in Daventry and now you're going to leave Daventry and you're going to go other places. 
Well, like where, where are you going to go? And so I would think, okay, well, let's see, I could have mountains. I could have a desert. Um, I could have some kind of water, a lake. Maybe you have to do something in water. You have to have a cliff. You have to have maybe, a, you know, I, and I, I would just have to think of interesting places that I could create new regions. And then and that's the part of beginning to do the map. You know, where you have my piece of paper and I go, okay, you start here and, you know, you go to the land of the ice and snow, you know, and then you can go to the land of, of fire, you know, and then the land of, of ocean or something, you know, and I write it down and what characters might you meet there and what might they, how are they going to hinder, hinder your process, your progress? You know, where is the problem area you need to get to? Where is that? And what's, you know, what, where's the things you need? Then I start looking at inventory items. What things do you need to get you there and to solve this and solve that? And what's going to hinder you and blah, blah, you know, and I just built it up little by little by little by little, little, literally doodling on my map. My way of designing is by mapping and looking at it, just literally looking at it as I'm building it up erasing, changing, building it up, building it up until I can literally see the entire game on one map. That at that point, and puzzles just come in, you know, they come in as I'm doing that. Um, so when I start working on a game, I don't know where it's going to end generally. I don't, I, I become very surprised myself. In fact, for me to design a game is like playing it because I don't know where it's going to go. I really don't know. So it sounds to me sort of like, it sounds like there's sort of like a lot of the process that authors go through when they're creating stories. You have, you have a problem, you have characters, you have a setting, but you go beyond that because it's sort of like an interactive story. Some people had made the analogy of choose your own adventure type of stories, but it's even more than that, not just Much more than that, right. not just different choices, but there's also, right. you know, lots the of inspiration. Uh, Yes, variations in, in, in yeah, you go where you you know, I try to I always try to let you explore as much as possible within a uh, I used to call them regions. I don't know today, maybe they have different terms, but within a region, say Davitry would be a region. Um, within it, I you know, I I I like to have the player be able to explore widely and and not tell them where you you must go here and then you must go there and then you must go here i i like to let them explore but at some point i've got to bring them back to a place where they get more of the story because there is a story involved and if you're too exploratory if you're just so open it's really hard to maintain a story and in the in the case of colossal cave Colossal Cave doesn't have a lot of story to it. Remember, it's the very first adventure game in history. It's the it's the beginning. It's the it, the progenitor of adventure games. And Will Crowther and Don Woods didn't really know or think about adding story to it. They just wanted to be widely exploratory in cave. So you can go just about anywhere. We you know you're not stopped in Colossal Cave, so you can go all over the place. Um, so you feel it's very exploratory, but you don't have as much story. And, the, and, and the, one of the things I've discovered is that you, you, you know, if you read a book or you watch a movie or anything that's a story, it's linear. So you start at the beginning of the story, you know, and of course you end with the you know, what, what happened, you know, finally here's the end and now you know what happened and you meet the characters along the way and they advance the story on and, you know, and everything, but you're following a linear story. You can't just go um, wherever you want in a story and go, you know, I don't want to talk to, I want to go over here. You can't do that in a book or a movie. You have to just watch it. You're, you're passive. So, but but you, at some point, but the reason why there's not much story in Colossal Cave is because once you add widely exploratory, story gets lost. 
you have you have to maintain some amount of linearity to maintain a story. And I see sometimes it, uh, adventure game designers will get very into their story and keep you pretty linear and kind of keep you from exploring as much as you could. And, and then in others, it just gets so exploratory that you, you, you just don't get a sense of the story. So one of the thing I think, things that I think that I, I, I figured out and I, I was pretty good at was how to put together an exploratory world along with the story. You know, how much exploration can you give them and yet bring them back to a story? Let them, let them learn and then give them another set of, you know, I always said it was kind of like beads on a necklace, you know, so it's like explore, story, explore, story, explore, story. So, um, and if you're over here, if you want, you can get back over here if I decide somehow, figure that out. But so give them exploration, but not so much as you lose your story. Yeah, that's a good answer. And I, it sort of makes me wonder about how, you know, game designers such as uh, Final Fantasy, how they do it, where they, you know, live like a sort of adventure, then they have a story cut scene. And then I wonder if they ha have some of the similar processes. Oh, yeah, you have to. I mean, you do. Um, and, and they, they, you know, if I could, you know, talk to the designers, they would say the same thing is uh, and, and you do have to rely a bit on cut scenes. Um, and the question is, how how involved do you want the cutscenes to 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 be? It some some people get very involved in their cutscenes and their characters and the you know the acting and you know the camera angles and movements and it and they get and their dialogue between each other they get very involved in that because they some of them sort of fancy themselves want to be screenwriters, you know, a little bit. And um, I, 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 I ran into that when I was working on Phantasmagoria um, because Phanta Phantasmagoria was probably the most um, cinemat cinematic um, game that I worked on. I had actors and it, and it definitely had a story. I mean, it had a big story. Um, and we'd had cut scenes and, and we had to do that and had the actors, you know, talk and, you know, and, and, and move forward the story. That's what you do. And I tried to keep them as, as short as I could. Um, and I think I did a pretty good job, but I couldn't get away from it if I wanted to really maintain a story. Um, and so it's really tricky doing that and then letting, and then letting the player go and explore again. Uh, it, is, it is, it's a tricky thing. And, and I think that the designers that figure out how to do it are always going to be the, the better ones. All right. So we're finishing up the 15 minutes. Do you want to answer two more questions? How do you, how do you feel? All right. Okay. So this first one should be easy one. What's the game you enjoy the most? You know, I'm not a, I've been asked that question so many times. Um, I'm not a, a big game player. I used to be, obviously. Playing games is what got me into the industry. And I, I was uh, obsessed with it. But, but it's like anything, you know, once you, once you get, once you start doing it as a business, it, it sort of loses its luster a little bit. And you want to do other things besides playing games. And, and, you know, even back when I was really doing it a lot, um, almost 20 years of doing games, um, even then I, I rarely played any games. And when I did, it was generally for research because I, I obviously wanted to keep up with what my, my uh, competitors were doing. So I would play their games and look at it and say, okay, what are they doing? And how can I beat them? <laughs> How can I be better than that? Uh, I'm a very competitive person. And then that's the whole thing. That's, you know, it's what you kind of want to do along with give people fun and entertainment, you, you know, so, but, 
but I, I've been gone from the business for 25 years and neither Ken or I played any games. And when I started on Colossal Cave to bring it back, I literally hadn't looked at a game in 25 years. And I, I mean, it was like jumping into a big sea, you know, and so I like, oh, I gotta, I gotta keep my head above the surface and I gotta get back into this. And can I? And the answer is yes, I can. And I did. Everything just pretty much came back. And so working on the game itself was not hard. That was easy. The hard part for both Ken and I is is selling the game, getting it out there because it's so competitive. There's so much product that and and it and and we're just not quite sure how to how to deal with it. So we're that's the part that's been hard for us. Um so it so it was did I answer the question or no yeah, so I a, really it, play yeah games. go ahead. Yeah. So you're, then, you know, right now I'm working on a little bit of research and I am looking at games now. But I don't I hate to disappoint, but that's the answer. I'll just tell you my favorite games uh, were on the Commodore 64. Um, there was two games, and I, I tend to like games that are action and adventure. There was two games. There was Dark Castle, which mm-hmm. was, you know, you had to choose, and you had to go through something, and you had to do challenges, and then you had to do something else. And then the other one was um, Impossible Mission, where you had to just solve different things, but then you had to solve a puzzle. So it was always like a different combination of, of both action and adventure. Um, mm-hmm. At least on that. Yeah, I have noticed definitely that um, there wasn't as much action adventure in the in the old days when we first came in. Uh, just having a good story, you know, and exploratory was was kind of good enough in a sense. You know, some interesting puzzles to solve. Um, but now, physicality and action is big a big deal, a big thing, and um, which is something we didn't really put into Colossal Cave. So. If any, anybody that's interested in purchasing it and playing it, um, you will notice that. But that's because it, it it it's derived from the original Colossal Cave, and and I strove very hard to make it be the same game. You know, if you're going to bring it back, you, you know, it needs to come back as it as it was, uh, and so that's the reason for that. But um, but I do understand that. Um, you know, solving puzzles in a physical way, you know, and using your hands and moving pieces and things around is, is interesting. It's good. Uh, Moving and jumping and, you know, and all that is, is, is big now. And um, just feeling more in the environment and using the environment around you. So I get that. I understand that. And I'm looking at things. All right, last question. What was the reason for moving away from Graham, the Graham family and Mask of Eternity? It was very different in many ways than any other King's Quest games. Well, you almost have to read Ken's book. Okay. Um, not all fairy tales have happy endings. Not all fairy tales have happy endings. Yes. Uh, because I was, as we said, we sold our company and I... I was just beginning to work on the design for King's Quest VIII as you know, be, right before we sold it. And when we sold it, it was very quick. It, it just it came on quickly, and it was a surprise to us even that it happened. And um, we got it got offered a very good deal, and uh, my inclination was not to do it. I really didn't want to do it. Because uh, I I loved my job, and I wanted to keep doing it. I really didn't want to be retired. <laughs> I wasn't old enough yet to be retired. I was still having fun, but um, the offer was such that um, we had a fiduciary duty um, on the board. We had we had a board. We were a big company. We were very professional, and uh, we we had we kind of had to do it. Uh, for the stockholders. We, we kind of didn't have a choice. And so we did. Um, when that happened, 
Ken was involved for a little while with, you know, putting the, our company together with the new company that was buying us and all, all of that. And I, I don't really want to get into that too much. Um, it's an interesting story though, but um, anyway, I remained working on King's Quest Eight. And, and I figured everything was going to go just like it always had it, and in the same way, but it didn't uh, because the, the new company wanted things their way. And they, I don't even know exactly who it was and, and all of that, but they, um, they, whoever was, and I, and I'm, I don't want to sound oblivious, you know, but I kind of am in, to a certain extent because I was just so busy with my game and I wasn't paying attention to the, you know, people running things and what they were doing. And, uh, but they were somehow, and, and this was sort of behind my back and I didn't know, I actually read it in Wikipedia of all things about two years ago about the, the uh, development of King's Quest VIII about how things were going on behind my back and that the company that were we had sold to um, had said to my team working with me on my on King's Quest 8 don't listen to her and uh, because we don't want it to be a, you know like an adventure game we want it to be a, uh, basically an RPG and um, but we're not going to tell her and I didn't know that. So I was busy designing the game the way I always did. And I, now why is there a different character that is outside of the Graham family? Um, I sort of wanted to do that. I wanted to develop a new character that's going to come in, but was eventually going to be a part of the, the family. So he was going to be kind of an outsider, but then become eventually, you know, like if I went to King's Quest Nine or whatever, it, there would be that he would become a part. But that never happened. Um, but beyond that, everything that I did and in designing it was was basically not done. And I would come back, and I my project manager, I would come back. And I would talk to him and I'd say, this is not what my design is. It's not what we discussed. This is, and he said, well, you know, others think that it, it should be like, this should be more like an RPG. And, and I said, well, but it's not an RPG. It's an adventure game. It's never been, King's Quest is not an RPG. It doesn't have experience and weapons and, you know, and I'm going to help and, you know, all this stuff. And it's not, that's not what it is. And people are going to expect it to be what it, is what it's always been. Bottom line, I things were going on behind me, behind my back, and I didn't know it. And I had I lost control. And it was really, really sad for me. I tried very hard to keep it as much as I could, trying to feel like King's Quest. I, I really tried, but I was, it was, it was me against you know, big entity and people that, and frankly, one of the things I sadly learned is that when you sell your company, you'd be surprised how many people want you to go <laughs> so they can take your place. You'd be surprised. Surprised me. But that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. I really appreciate you. Um, coming in talking about uh, the history and everything and getting updated. I really, really appreciate it. Um, so your oh, invitation is always open to come to any VCF East in the future. I know you're, you're busy with your life. Um, and there's also VCF West, which it was usually takes place at computer history museum. Um, okay. So, yeah. Well, we, you know, if we ever in the area um, and it, and it just happens to be, well, then of course we would. We, that would be an honor. And it's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, VCF East for everyone out there um, is next week, uh, April 14th, 15th, and 16th. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers um, and a lot of great exhibits coming up. Uh, it's going to be your biggest show yet. Um, 
So vcfed.org. And do you want to plug your Cygnus company? What is your Cygnus? Uh... Cygnus Entertainment. <laughs> right now, it's a, it's a it's a one game enterprise. I don't I don't know if I even call it a company, um, but it, it could grow. You know, you know, it, we, you know, Ken and I are keeping an open mind. So we'll just see what happens. Yeah, wonderful. And I'm glad that Mark has suggested uh, that we talk to you and uh, making this happen. I, I sort of, it sort of went in a circle the way Mark has explained the story. Hey, Ken, <laughs> good to see you again. Just saying hi. All right. Yeah, sure. Come on in. Come on in to, you can come in. Yeah, I'm kind of here. He's kind of here. He's kind of here. So, Not an important um, person. <laughs> I had, I had, uh, so the, you know, I had, uh, gotten Ken to come to the virtual show and then Marcus was going to do his um his exhibits and it's like oh well you can you can be before Ken talking it's like what <laughs> so I that remember he, that and then That's he got in touch with Marcus oh yeah that? <laughs> yeah you you know, it's weird how, how Ken met Marcus. <laughs> yeah, you're the guilty party. <laughs> part Hi, a big part of our life. <laughs> Uh, so then he gets got. I didn't. I didn't even know that whole story. I have to talk to Marcus, but it, apparently he got in contact with you, and he got you interested in remaking a game. And then one of our other um, members was helping with some some coding or sort of some processing of of something, and, and it was all you know non disclosure agreement. And so then all of a sudden there's you know the game comes out and then now he's like hey we've got this game you want to interview yeah. roberta yeah we actually have a game it's colossal cave everybody and it is modernized and it actually is really fun and it's getting good reviews oh. it, it really is it is getting good reviews so hopefully this, you know, we're growing with our YouTube channel here. We put a lot of content. So hopefully this will propagate outward. Um, nice. <laughs> and some glitches we're setting up here, but it should be good now. And uh, people can keep watching this video and and, uh, and seeing what you had to say. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right.